Well, brethren, in the previous hour, we began to identify those disciplines that are ordained by God to promote and to secure what I have described as a real, expanding, varied, and original acquaintance with God and his ways. I directed your attention to the first of these disciplines and in some ways perhaps the most crucial of all of them, namely the discipline of the devotional assimilation of the word of God. In this hour, I trust to identify four more disciplines which under the blessing of the Holy Spirit become means by which the fullness of grace that is in our Lord Jesus is poured into the heart and life of the man of God. And let's ask God's help as we address these further disciplines that the Spirit of God would teach us and incline our hearts to embrace whatever light and whatever conviction, whatever encouragement God would give to us in our study together. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for that changeless word of gracious invitation to come boldly to the throne of grace in order that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We thank you for the obtaining and the finding virtue of prayer. And we come to obtain, we come to find, and, O oh Lord, we ask that by your grace we will be given all that we need to obtain and all that we need to find, that we may profit from the instruction of this hour. Help your servant that he may speak your truth accurately, that your people, your servants gathered under that instruction may profit from it, and that together with the spirit of the Bereans we may receive the word with readiness of mind, but calling no man master, search the scriptures to see if indeed these things are so. Come to us then according to your promise, we plead in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now as I've indicated, as time permits, I want to address the four remaining disciplines. And the first of those four is found in the middle of page five on your printed outline as large letter B. And I've described it as maintaining the habit and the spirit of secret prayer. I'm not here referring to what I will later call in another unit of study, pastoral intercessory prayer, a subject so crucial that I seek to address it under a separate heading, but I'm concerned here to address the subject of secret prayer as it pertains to our needs as men of God, our need to be worshipers as men of God and as Christian men, our need to be engaged in secret, private praise, the confession of our own sins, wrestling with our own perplexities, our own struggles. It's in this area of the man of God praying with respect to the concerns of his own heart as a Christian man. And then by the words habit and spirit, this is what I mean. By habit, I mean secret prayer that occurs because we've made specific times marked out for this discipline. The text printed in your notes surely point in this direction. Jesus said in Luke 18, 1, men ought always to pray and not to faint. In Psalm 5, verses 1 to 3, Surely, David is indicating here something of what I'm describing as the habit of prayer. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken to the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you shall hear my voice. In the morning will I order my prayer unto you and will keep watch. While not denying 
what has commonly been called ejaculatory prayer or living in the spirit and disposition of prayer, here David speaks of a specific time when God will hear his voice in prayer. Psalm 55 verses 15 and 16 point in the same direction. Psalm 55 verses 16 and 17. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noonday will I complain and moan and he will hear my voice. Here is the set of the psalmist's renewed will to seek God in specific times of prayer. And then we have that example of our Lord in Mark 1.35, rising a great while before day. He goes out to a secret place in order to pray. He has marked out this time to seek the face of his Father. And certainly the language of Matthew 6, verses 5 and 6. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, but when you pray, Enter your closet, shut the door, and pray to your Father in secret. Surely, this is pointing to something beyond living in the spirit of prayer, offering up ejaculatory prayer. It is speaking of set seasons of purposed time in order to engage in secret prayer. And then the example of Daniel in chapter 6 and verse 10 and when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house. Now his windows were open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. And he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. In a crisis, Daniel does nothing new. It was his pattern to have set times of prayer. So when I use the term habit, maintaining the habit and the spirit of prayer, I'm talking about our commitment to mark out specific times in order to seek the face of God with respect to the needs of our heart, the duties we have of prayer and worship, confession of sin, seeking the face of God for strength and grace, for what we are to be as Christian men and what we are called upon to do as Christian pastors. Now by using the term spirit of prayer, I mean prayer in which there is an engagement of the heart by the enabling grace and power of the Holy Spirit. It is not without reason that God designates the Holy Spirit as the spirit of grace and of supplication. And that the apostle tells us in Romans 8, in that great perplexity connected with prayer, we know not how to pray as we ought. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in this very infirmity. And again, when Jude, we are given that exhortation uh, to build ourselves up in our most holy faith, it is to be in conjunction with praying in the Holy Spirit. Spirit. So when I use the term the spirit of secret prayer, I'm speaking of prayer which by the enabling power of the Spirit engages the whole heart of the child of God so that he can say with the psalmist in Psalm 119 in verse 10, with my whole heart have I sought you. Or Jeremiah 29, 13, you shall seek me and find me in the day that you search for me with all your heart. And any one of us who has any experience in the things of God, we know that while our renewed judgment tells us that in seeking God, in praising God, there ought to be the engagement of the whole heart. We are equally conscious that without the enabling power of the Spirit, the heart goes out in a hundred directions or is a mass of dullness and distractedness. And so by the Spirit of prayer, I'm referring to prayer in which there is the engagement of the heart by the enabling grace and power of the Holy Spirit. Now it is this discipline of the habit and spirit of secret prayer in the life of the man of God 
which is a vital means to advance the work of grace in our souls. And that for at least five reasons. Number one, it is in such prayer that our personal communion with our Heavenly Father and with our Savior is both renewed, nurtured, and increased. Jesus said, when you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven. J.I. Packer in his, what is now, I think, rightly considered a classic work on knowing God, indicates in his chapter on adoption that the whole thrust of all of the revelation of God in Christ is to bring a community who can address God intelligently with a filial delight as their Father who is in heaven. And it's in the engagement of secret prayer, addressing him as our Father who is in the heavens. Peter indicating that that will be our experience if you call on him as Father. 1 Peter 1 So it is in that engagement in secret prayer that our communion with and our enjoyment of that filial relationship is deepened and nurtured and enhanced. And it's interesting that when Paul describes the evidence of the Spirit's work in the heart of those who've come into the blessing of adoption, he focuses upon the Spirit enabling us to cry, Abba, Father giving us a felt awareness of our legal status as sons of God, enabling us to address God in the warmth and in the security of our relationship as his sons. Or take the emphasis of the book of Hebrews. One of its dominant motifs is found in the words, let us draw near. Everything in the old covenant worship said, Keep your distance. You draw near only through the priest. Now God says, draw near. The priest has done his work. He's offered the once for all sacrifice. And in that beautiful contrast in in chapter 12, you are not come, but you are come. The motif of draw near, 416, 79, 725, Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near. And all of it based upon the reality of an accomplished redemption in our Lord Jesus. And since we draw near through our mediator and high priest, our advocate, our intercessor, our communion with Christ is likewise renewed and increased and deepened in the context of secret prayer. And so the yearning of the Apostle, Philippians 3.10, to know him, the great prayer of the Apostle in Ephesians 3.14 to 19, that we might know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, the exhortation of Peter in 2 Peter 3.18, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus in great measure. Those realities are experienced not exclusively in the activity of secret prayer, but in a heightened, concentrated, and elevated way. And surely, brethren, if there's to be the fragrance of Christ in our labors, if there's to be filial delight and liberty in our pastoral prayers, publicly and privately with our people, if the flavor of the closet is not upon us, these things will be hollow and empty and will not touch the hearts of our people. And so the discipline of the habit And the spirit of secret prayer is crucial for us because it is here that our communion with our Father and our Savior is intensified and nurtured and expanded. But secondly, it is this kind of prayer by which our perspective of reality is kept in proper focus. There are a thousand things constantly pressing in upon our senses and upon our consciousness that tie us to the things that are seen, the things that are touched and felt and heard, observed. And it's difficult for us to keep a proper perspective on the things that are not seen. But the apostle could say in 2 Corinthians 4.18, reflecting upon his assessment of present trials, 
He identifies them as light afflictions, which are but for a moment. For him, they were part of his lifetime. And he says, a lifetime of light afflictions? Light afflictions, Paul? A day and a night in the deep? Stripes at the hands of the Jews? Imprisonment? Stone? Light afflictions? Yes. And they are but momentary light afflictions. They are working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while, while we look not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And it's in the secret place that that proper perspective is kept in focus. As I say, there are a thousand things to bring us to gaze upon what is seen and to think that the substantial reality is what we see and the ephemeral is what is not seen. Just the opposite is true. Paul says what is seen is temporal, it is passing, it is fleeting. What is not seen is the eternal Psalm 73 is a wonderful example of this in a concrete set of circumstances. You remember the setting. Asaph looks about him and he sees the wicked prospering in life, having an easy life and an easy death. And he looks at himself and the people of God and says, we're afflicted day after day. One trouble piggybacks itself upon another. And he says, it didn't make sense. And I got to the place where I was almost like a beast, a creature tied to the world of sense and stuff and things. He says, until, until I went into the sanctuary of God and considered their latter end. And then everything came into focus. And he says, all right, I'm here for a time. I'm afflicted, yes, but I'm being guided with your counsel. And then... I shall be received into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? None that I desire upon earth but yourself. What happened? Perspective was once again regained in the context of the secret place. And how crucial it is for us, brethren, to carry about with us not a theoretical and correct theology of where we are in our present experience, but an existential, felt, gut reality of those issues so that we put all that transpires around us and all that God does with us into that proper biblical perspective. And no little part of maintaining that perspective is the habit and the spirit of secret prayer. Thirdly, it's the kind of prayer in which our own sins are seen in their true light. In Psalm 90 and verse 8, there is that fascinating phrase from the prayer of Moses, the man of God. Psalm 90 and verse 8, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. And when we reflect that in drawing near to the throne of grace, we draw near to one who is infinitely holy, His holiness has not in any way been diminished in the full revelation of His grace, It's just the opposite. Holiness shines more brilliantly through the prism of the cross than it ever did on Mount Sinai, than it ever did in the consuming of the cities of the plains because of their wretched perversion. It's when we see immolated, incarnate deity, the heaven shrouded in blackness, and we hear the cry of dereliction, my God. My God, why have you forsaken me? That irritated word to one's wife, that second look at that attractive body, that spirit of jealousy of the gifts of another brother, when we view them in the light of the revelation of holiness in the cross of Christ, we see our sins in a new and a more accurate light. You remember the experience of Isaiah, this gentleman 
of a true son of the old covenant. He was no bum, he was no derelict, and yet when he sees the Lord high and lifted up upon his throne, and he beholds those strange creatures, two wings covering face and two with feet and two they fly, and they cry one to another, holy, holy, holy. And in that context, he sees what he is. God in his infinite burning holiness. Isaiah the man, the son of Adam, though a true son of the covenant, a child of God, we would say in our terminology, yet woe is me. He sees himself and his uncleanness terminates not upon what his hands touched that they should not or places his feet went that they ought not to have gone but upon his lips. I'm a man of unclean lips. In many things we all offend. If any offend not in word, the same is a perfect man also able to bridle the whole body. It's in the engagement of secret prayer that our sins are seen in their true light and when seen in their true light, fourthly, it becomes the kind of prayer in which our pardon and our acceptance in the beloved one are sealed afresh to our hearts. We experience Psalm 130 and verse 3, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And in that context, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, goes on cleansing from all sin. This is why I've never given stock to people who say, well, uh, I, I don't want a ministry that shows me my sin. I, I want a ministry that encourages me. With what? I ask, encourages you with what? What's more encouraging than seeing my sin afresh and in a new penetrating understanding of its depth, of its insidious grip upon my own spirit, upon my thinking, upon my act, and reacting and I say Lord where can I go but to the fountain open for sin and uncleanness Christ becomes more precious as my sin becomes more odious the more I see my need of the cleansing of his blood the more precious becomes the one who shed that blood and fifthly it is in this engagement in the habit and spirit of secret prayer that it becomes the kind of prayer in which grace for our work is sought and obtained. The text I quoted in our opening prayer, Hebrews 4, 16, I love the text because of the vigor of those words, let us draw near to the throne of grace, the throne that for some of us for years was nothing but a throne of terror. To think of God enthroned was to draw out in us a sense of dread. He sees me. He knows me. Everywhere I go, his eye is upon me. I can't hide from him. I can't escape his eye. And all that he sees and knows will meet me in the day of judgment. To think of an enthroned God terrified us. But now it's a throne of grace. The same throne. With the same God seated upon it, but now a throne of grace. Why? Having then a great high priest. Let us draw near with boldness to the throne of grace. To do what? Not simply to unburden ourselves and to maintain spiritual equilibrium by doing what the psalmist says, pour out your heart before him at all times. I love that imagery. Your heart's a vessel full of all kinds of stuff and you can't even sort out the ingredients. God says, just tip it over and let it all spill out before your God. God's never shocked. He never, ooh, ooh, that's in him. Yeah, he knew it all the while. He said, now you pour it out. Pour it out. And there's a tremendous spiritual benefit in that dimension of secret prayer. But think of this benefit. We come to receive 
and to obtain. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. Pity joined to action. That's what mercy is. Pity joined to action. Not just pity, but pity that sees the pitiable and responds accordingly. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. The wisdom we need as pastors. The courage, the boldness, the mental and spiritual strength. The patience to bear with some of God's crotchety children. Some of those saints, you say, oh, Bunyan had it right. If all you can do is get them down to the river with their crutches, you say, Lord, I've done my job. You come to the realization you're not a fatalist. But you say, there's some saints, they're going to go down to the river hobbling. If we can just get them to the river. (laughs) And there are times when you say, Lord, do I need this person as one of the sheep? Lord, how many times I have to go over and over and over. I think of one of my fellow elders who's dealing now with one of our sheep. That the history of this sheep is, we come right up to the border saying, enough is enough. We can exercise discipline. And then you deal with him. And I mean, you give it to him straight on, right in the nose. He bleeds. He staggers. And they come back saying, I sinned. (laughs) He says, will you pray for me? Will you help me? And there you go. You wipe the blood off his nose and reset it and say, okay, can't discipline him. He's still acting like a child of God. When his sin is pointed out, he deals with it. We're not talking about adultery or some other gross moral aberration that you'd have to discipline and then let time go to prove the repentance. Well, where in the world are we going to get the grace to put up with sheep like that? At the throne of grace. Crying out to God, telling God, Lord, I'm not like you. You bear with me. How many times, Lord, have I done the same stuff? stupid, evil thing, and yet I come and you forgive me, you cleanse me, you wipe the blood off my nose, you pick me up, you put me on my way. It's at the throne of grace, brethren, that we are kept from irritation toward such sheep, that we obtain the grace that we need to bear patiently with him. We go back to Isaiah 40, one of the first passages I remember memorizing As a young Christian, even the young men are going to grow weary and they're going to grow faint. Not just the old men, but the young men. Those that we think are the paragons of natural strength. Even the youth shall faint. But they that wait upon the Lord of whatever age shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and They shall walk and they shall not faint. Brethren, we must, if we are to have this continued, expanding, varied, real walk with our God, we must continue in the spirit and the habit of secret prayer. I commend to you those two quotes that are uh, in your notes from Uh, Bridges, the Christian ministry, I read just the first of them. Luther long since has said, Prayer, meditation, and temptation make a minister. No one will hesitate to admit the importance of the first of these qualifications who's ever realized the weight of ministerial responsibility, who has been led to know that his sufficiency is of God and that prayer is the appointed channel of heavenly communications. The student's conscious need of wisdom, humility, and faith to ascertain the pure simplicity of his purpose, his necessary qualifications, his divine call to the holy office will bring him a daily supplicant to the throne of grace. In his general studies, speaking of someone preparing for the ministry, abstracted from the spirit of prayer, he will find a dryness, a want of power to draw his resources to this one center of the ministry, or perhaps a diversion from the main object into some track of self-indulgence. And even in this special duty of the scriptures, he will feel himself 
like a blind man contemplating the heavens, or as when the world in its original confusion was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, God must speak to his heart, let there be light, and for this he will be inquired of to do it unto them. How many times must the Lord say to us, you have not, because you ask not. All we need to be able ministers of the new covenant is there in the bank of heaven, stored up in the infinite fullness that is in our Lord Jesus. But we must come to the teller's window, and that teller's window is called the throne of grace. Coming to the throne of grace that we may obtain and find grace to help in time of need. Now, I'm sure you're aware, as I am, that there are some excellent, helpful books on the discipline and the habit of secret prayer, volume two of Brooks, The Privy Key of Heaven, Bunyan on Prayer, McIntyre's helpful little book, The Hidden Life of Prayer, and many others. But brethren, when all is said and done, we learn to pray by praying. And without praying, we'll not learn to pray. And without the discipline and the habit of secret prayer, it is likely we will never make much progress in the matter of our praying. There is a quote from Albert N. Martin that I somehow omitted in the opening. Here we are, and I want to find it where I spoke of the habit of secret prayer. And, well, I'll give it to you at the end. I'll be able to put my finger on it. It has to do with the fact that He who only prays by impulse, it won't be long before he does not pray at all. One of the best ways to secure return from a period of spiritual barrenness is the maintenance of the structures that were in place in times of spiritual fruitfulness. Maintain the disciplines and the habits even in a period of dryness. And as you do, and you engage in those God-ordained means, God will come with fresh life and fresh vigor to your soul. And so I commend to you then this second discipline of the expanding walk with God, foundational, the devotional assimilation of the Word of God. Secondly, the maintenance of the habit and the spirit of secret prayer. And now we come in the third place to this third discipline, and I'm calling it the discipline of maintaining a good conscience before God and before men. The maintenance of a good conscience before God and man. If we have any question about the significance of this matter, of the maintenance of a good conscience. I know of no text that is more frightening than the one that the apostle gives us from his letter to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. This charge I commit unto you, my child Timothy, according to the prophecies that led the way to you, that by them you may war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, And we could rightly render the next words, which thing, not things, in number and gender, the which refers to the conscience, good conscience, which thing some having thrust from them made shipwreck concerning the faith. The first step to apostasy is thrusting away a good conscience. Not good doctrine, or not necessarily good morals. The first step to apostasy is thrusting away a good conscience. That's the most frightening text pointing to this third discipline of an expanding, vital, real walk with God, maintaining a good conscience before God and man, And no text is more helpful in a positive way than Acts 24 and verse 16. And I want us to park for a little bit on that text.
together. Acts 24 and verse 16. Paul is giving one of his defenses before the pagan ruler. And he says, in the light of the coming day of resurrection of the just and the unjust, verse 16, Acts 24, herein, in the light of that day of universal and total, unmistakable exposure before the living God, herein I also exercise myself. I subject myself to a rigorous spiritual discipline. And what is it? to have a conscience void of offense toward God and men always. The apostle says that he was conscious of engaging in a constant spiritual discipline of maintaining a good conscience, a conscience void of offense before God and before man. Unless the two previous disciplines, that of the assimilation of the word and the maintenance of the habit and the spirit of secret prayer are joined to the discipline of the maintenance of a good conscience, those exercises become a kind of mystical thumb-sucking. They produce no nourishment. They give us a false comfort. To continue to read one's Bible and to pray and to profess to be enjoying the scriptures and enjoying communion with God without the maintenance of a good conscience before God and man is a kind of mystical thumb-sucking. Now what does it mean to exercise oneself to have at all times a conscience void of offense to God and to man? It means, first of all, that you have no present conscious controversy with God. You have no present conscious controversy with God. It doesn't mean sinless perfection. There may be areas in your life that in the progress of sanctification you have not yet become aware of. Attitudes, perspectives, ways of responding to people. But as Calvin said, God does not allow us to see the 100th part of our sin. And in the progress of sanctification, God deals with us graciously and loving as a loving father. A father does not deal with a five-year-old son as though he were 15. He has the expectations of his present level of development. So I've chosen my words carefully. What does it mean to have a conscience void of offense towards God at all times? It means that I can say, as Paul did in 1 Corinthians 4, I know nothing against myself. Standing in this moment, I have no conscious controversy with God. That means no sin committed, but not confessed. Secondly, no duty known, but not performed or determined to perform by the enabling grace of God. No truth brought to my understanding, but rejected in pride or willful unbelief. To have a conscience void of offense toward God at all times means that at any point I can stand and say, by the grace of God, there is no sin committed, but not confessed, cleansed, and washed in the blood of Christ. No duty known that I am not performing or determined to perform by the enabling grace of God. No truth that is impinged upon the tablets of my mind, but rejected because it exceeds the capacity of my mind to wrap my mental fingers around it and I'm uncomfortable with mystery, I'm uncomfortable with apparent contradiction and in my pride I'm rejecting in that pride or by unbelief that truth. It seems to me, brethren, as I've wrestled with what are the particular ingredients 
of a conscience void of offense toward God, these three things are at least at the heart of what that means. So then, to have this conscience void of offense means that I will be having constant recourse to the blood of Christ for cleansing and to the grace and power of Christ for an upright walk. Cleansing and new supplies of grace for an upright walk. So that, as I've said, we can say with Paul, I know nothing against myself, or in the language of the psalmist, whoever that psalmist was. In Psalm 119, you will notice that I don't say David. I'm agnostic about the author of Psalm 119, but I know it's God's word, and that's all that really counts at the end of the day. Verses 101 and 102. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might observe thy word. I have not turned aside from your ordinances, for you have taught me. Now that's not a claim to sinless perfection. That's a claim to walking with a conscience void of offense towards God. Where God says that so many, this sin or that is to be avoided, you can say, I've refrained my feet from every evil way. That means, my brothers, when you go to the CVS, you know where the magazine wax are, and you don't walk down that aisle. That's what it means. Okay? I refrain my feet. So I can walk out of CVS and say, thank you, Lord, I refrained my feet from that evil way. I knew it was there. I knew it was enticing. It was inviting me. It was seeking to seduce me. But I refrained my feet. Didn't say, thank you, Holy Ghost, that you refrained them. I did it. But then you're quick to say, I did it by your grace. Lord, take your hand off me, and I'd wallow in the garbage and let my eye run up and down all the half-bared breasts and more. Lord, that's who I am, left to myself. But by your grace, determined to walk with a good conscience, I've refrained my feet from every evil way. I refrained my fingers from clicking those things on my search mechanism on my computer that will bring up images that I know will defile my mind. I have refrained my fingers from every evil way. Walking by your computer with a good conscience that you do not allow it to become an inlet to uncleanness or to wasted time, whatever it is. No sin committed, but not confessed, no duty known, but not performed or determined to perform by the grace of God, no truth impinging on the mind, but rejected in pride or unbelief. I believe that's what it means in essence to have a conscience void of offense towards God. But now Paul says, I exercise myself to have a conscience always Void of offense toward man. What does that mean? It means that you have sought to resolve in a biblical manner any horizontal relationship which has been disrupted by your sin. To resolve in a biblical manner any horizontal relationship which has been disrupted by your sin. If you've caused hurt to your wife, with angry words, with insensitive words. You don't just mumble in some half-hearted way, oh, no, I'm sorry, I blew it. No, you own your sin and you say, dear, I sinned with my hasty, curt, unkind words. Will you forgive me? Now, people tell me I'm just a stickler for words when I say, look, saying I'm sorry doesn't mean you've confessed your sin. When I say to someone I'm sorry, I'm telling them how I feel. I tell my wife, I say, dear, I'm sorry I'm going deaf. But I don't say, will you forgive me for going deaf? But I am sorry. I feel bad. She's got to bear the burden of my half-deafness. I feel bad. 
When someone comes to me and says, Pastor Martin, I'm sorry about this, I say, well, that's interesting. Pastor Dunn, when his kids would come to him and say, Dad, I'm sorry. He tried to teach them this lesson. He said, well, that's interesting. I'm hungry. <laughs> you tell me you're sorry, you feel bad. I tell you I'm hungry. I feel bad too. Mine's here and yours here. No, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. And what's true vertically is true horizontally. If your brother sin, rebuke him. If he repent, forgive him. And if he come to you seven times in the day saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. To have a conscience void of offense toward man means if we have caused hurt to wife, to children, to church members, to fellow officers, by angry, insensitive, untruthful words, we own our sin and we seek their forgiveness. Now, if they withhold it, the ball's in their court. The minute I say, Leslie, I sinned against you, will you forgive me? I've taken my sin, knocked it over the net, and put it at his foot. Now, he's got to take the racket of a Christ-like disposition and say, my brother, I forgive you. And then the rackets are thrown away and the ball's disposed of and the net's taken down and our relationship is restored. As we deal with God, oh God forgive me for this or that violation of your law. Forgive me for this duty not done. Forgive me for this transgression. Lord, wash me, cleanse me in your blood. You have said, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and righteous to forgive. And likewise, in our relationship to one another, to have a conscience void of offense, we must be willing to right those wrongs with others who have been the recipients of our moral aberrations. If it's a neglect of a clear duty to others, own your sin and seek their forgiveness. How many times has God has shown me things from the word that have been there all along and I've not been sensitive to them and God's dealt with me. I've had to stand before the congregation and I have people who sit here in that congregation to know whether this is just preacher's talk or real and say, brethren, I see that this clear duty, I should have seen it. I should have helped guide you into it. But for one reason or another, I have not. I've asked God's forgiveness. I ask your forgiveness. Now let us together bring forth fruits, meet for repentance. How often in the heat of preaching I've overstated something or I've stated something with an edge that upon reflection, sometimes in a closing prayer, my heart is smitten like David when he cut off that square inch of Saul's robe and it says his conscience, his heart smote him. And I couldn't lead in the closing prayer without saying, brethren, at this part in the sermon, I said thus and thus, there was an edge of carnality. I've asked God's forgiveness. Will you forgive me? And I've had people come and say, oh, Pastor Martin, that must have been hard. I said, no, no, that's not hard. The hard thing would be to go home with an accusing conscience and know that my God is displeased that I was unwilling to deal with my sin. And the hard thing is not to do it again, not to do it another time. Brethren, it's vital that we with Paul can say, Herein do I exercise myself to have at all times a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. A defiled and an accusing conscience will take away your hunger for the word. In the sinner, hatred of the light is the dominant disposition of his soul. John 3.19 this is the condemnation. Light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Neither will they come to the light lest their deeds should be manifest. Though the disposition of hating the light, having an aversion to God and to his word and to his nearer presence is dominant in the unconverted, remember the principle. Remaining sin, though it does does not dominate in the believer, it is the same in kind. Not in degree, but in kind. And your remaining sin has an aversion to light. 
when you have sinned and you are not coming into the light of God's countenance in the way of confession and repentance, that aversion will manifest itself by finding flimsy excuses to skip your devotional reading to bypass secret prayer, and most often for us as ministers, it's some, quote, holy pastoral duty, some visit to be made, some call to be made, some this, some that, and at the root of it is an aversion to the close dealing with God in the scriptures and in prayer because of sin that's not been dealt with in a biblical way. And if you're honest, you know what I say is true. Brethren, we dare not allow anything to cut the nerve of our passion to draw near to God, to meet with God. A defiled and accusing conscience will not only give you this aversion to the word if it doesn't drive you to the throne of grace for forgiveness, it will drive you away in a sulking aversion to any close dealings with God. Listen to these sobering words from John Owen, quoted by Alexander in his letter to young ministers. Page 110 in those notes. I am persuaded, says Owen, there are very few that apostatize from a profession of any continuance such as our days abound with but their door of entrance into the folly of backsliding was either some great and notorious sin that bloodied their consciences, tainted their affections, and intercepted all delight of having anything more to do with God, or else it was a course of neglect in private duties arising from a weariness of contending against that powerful aversation, we would say aversion, which they found in themselves unto them. Remaining sin has an aversion to close dealings with God. And this also through the craft of Satan has been improved into many foolish and sensual opinions of living unto God without and above any duties of communion. And we find that after men have for a while choked and blinded their consciences with this pretense, cursed wickedness or sensuality has been the end of their folly. Of all people on earth, ministers most need the constant impressions derived from closet piety. And then he goes on to tell us why. The last part of that paragraph, how often you fast or sing or pray must be left to be settled between God and your conscience. Only fix in your mind and heart the necessity of much devotion. Devotion in the context of maintaining a conscience void of offense to God and to man. And let me conclude this part of the lecture by giving you a bibliography of materials that I have found helpful in this matter of the conscience, which tragically is not given anywhere near its proper place in current thinking and teaching and preaching on the Christian life. I'm presently, as I mentioned earlier, going through in my own devotion, Psalm 119 with Bridges. And if you will look at the index in the back of that book, under conscience, you will find about four references, and I recommend especially pages 165 to 172, some of the finest material on this subject of maintaining a good, a healthy, a well-instructed conscience in our walk with God. And then a number of years ago, Dr. Bob Martin brought a series of 14 uh, messages. They are coded in the Trinity pulpit uh, uh, materials as R, P, as in penny, dash, O, 1 through 14. And then a number of years ago in a series on the doctrine of perseverance, I preached 10 sermons on the matter of conscience, concentrating on how to maintain a good conscience, and they are coded T, P as in penny, dash, L, 
dash 15 through 24. Well, may God help us, brethren, as we've addressed these first three disciplines by which God has ordained we as his servants may experience this real, this large, this varied, this expanding experience of God and of his ways. And may God help us that the years will prove that we've laid to heart the things in which I trust our convictions have been refreshed and reinforced. And for those who've heard them for the first time, I hope they'll be implanted and germinate and continue to bear fruit until we cross the river. Let's pray. Our Father, once again, looking into the depths of our own hearts is never a pleasant experience. And we confess with shame the reality of our remaining sin and that there is in us, in spite of the indwelling of your Spirit, in spite of the mighty transformation of regenerating grace, in spite of our union with Christ, in spite of the dethronement of sin as our Master and our Lord, this vile remaining corruption, and that when it is active, it creates in us an aversion to close dealings with you. It leads us into paths of rationalization, of justification of that which you condemn. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, we pray, and hasten the day. O oh God, hasten the day when we shall have perfected spirits inhabiting deathless bodies in the new heavens and in the new earth, forever with you, forever to serve you, never to sin again. Bless your word. Seal it to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.